Hello everyone, in this video tutorial we will cover several topics that are important for applied mathematics, finite element analysis, signal processing, and control theory and engineering. We will introduce the concept of quadratic forms and relate this concept with the concepts of positive definite, negative definite, and semi-definite matrices. Furthermore, we will present the tests for determining if a matrix is positive definite, negative definite, semi-definite or indefinite. Then we will explain you how to plot quadratic forms in MATLAB and we will explain what are the leading principal minors of matrices. As I mentioned, all these concepts are extremely important for analyzing and understanding more advanced engineering and mathematical concepts. What you can see over here is the post I created that nicely summarizes everything that I will explain in this video. This post contains all the theory, examples, graphs, and even MATLAB codes that are used to make these graphs. So my advice is to first watch this video, then read this post in order to better understand this material. A link to the post is provided in description below. Before I start, I have to mention the following. It took me a significant amount of time to create this post and this video. Consequently, please consider to subscribe to my channel and press the like button. Okay, so let's start. Quadratic forms can be seen as generalizations of one-dimensional quadratic functions to two or more dimensions. For example, from your basic calculus classes or even high school level mathematics classes, you remember a basic form of the quadratic equation. So, in its most simplest form, the quadratic equation looks like this. And its equation is y is k x square. Here k is a positive constant since the function is oriented in this way. Now the question is the following. How can we generalize this function to two or more dimensions? Well, over here you can see such a generalization. This is the generalization of the quadratic functions in two dimensions. The equation that describes this function is v is equal to some constant k1 times x1 square plus k2 times x2 square and v is this axis x1 is this axis and x2 is this axis. The function that you can see over here is one of the examples of a broader class of functions that are called the quadratic forms. A general form of quadratic forms is represented by the equation 1. Here in this representation, x is n-dimensional vector with entries x1 until xn. In our previous case, vector x only had two entries. The entries were x1 and x2. Here, the matrix P is basically a symmetric matrix. So this matrix P belongs to the class of symmetric matrices, meaning that P is equal to its transpose. Now, let us go back to our original example. This was our quadratic form. Here, assume k1 is 2 and k2 is 3. 
Okay, so let us try to write this equation in this form over here. So how to do that? What's the procedure? Well, if we kind of analyze this equation, we can observe that we can write this equation as follows. We take x1 and x2, put them in a row vector, then we take x1 and x2, we put them in a column vector, and these two vectors are multiplying from left and right side this matrix, 2 and 3. So if you multiply all these terms over here, you will see that the result is actually equal to our function. And in our case, the function, or actually better to say the matrix, P is a diagonal matrix with these constants 2 and 3 on its main diagonal. Let us look now into more general forms of quadratic forms. Let us assume that the P matrix is fully populated. And we are assuming here that this matrix is symmetric, that is, these two terms of diagonal terms are equal to each other. Now, let us write down this function. Here's our v of x function. And let us expand everything on, that is on the right-hand side. Here, first I multiply the, mat multiply the matrix P by this vector. I obtain this vector. Then I multiply this row vector with this column vector. And I obtain a general form of two-dimensional quadratic form. What is interesting about this equation over here? We can see that every element or every entry is the second order entry. Here we have squares, here we have squares, and here we have the multiplication of two first order entries. Okay, now let us consider the following five P matrices and let us analyze the shape of our quadratic form for these 5p matrices. Now, for p1, for the case of p1, the function, the quadratic function, will take this form. Notice the form of p1. p1 is simply diagonal matrix, so we have something that looks like paraboloid, right? Okay, so let us now change the form of p2 and let us look into the result. Aha! Uh -huh. This is what happens if we change the form of P2. We have this form over here. So let us go back and analyze this form. So what we did, we increase the value corresponding to this entry T3, 2 actually, X2, and we increased off diagonal entries. As the result, we obtained this shape over here. Aha, uh -huh. let us see what happens if we select our P3 matrix to look like this. Notice here that we have only perturbed the signs and let's see what happens with the form. Aha, uh -huh, we get a completely different form, right? So it's somehow rotated, shifted, mirrored, right? Some operations have been performed by just changing the signs. Then let's look into the form P4, okay? Here we have changed our P2 and P3 further and let's see what happens. Aha, uh -huh, we have something that looks like a saddle. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And finally, let's look into the form P5, where we just have matrix of ones, and this form is illustrated over here. What is interesting over here, and you will see later, that this matrix is positive semi-definite, and you will see that this matrix is zero for X1 and X2 belonging to a certain line. Here, I will stop for a second in order to explain the MATLAB code I've wrote for visualizing the quadratic forms. I'll be using the MATLAB mesh grid function for generating a grid of points at which the quadratic forms are being calculated. First, we specify the vector x1 and the vector 2 that define the grid. The vector x1 will start from minus 50, it will end at 50 with a step of 2. This will be basically the grid step in the x1 direction. And similarly, the vector x2 will be defined from minus 50 with a step 2 until 50. Then we basically define the grid 
here is our x1 matrix this is x2 matrix you can see all the variables by trying to type in who's and next uh, we specify the symbolic variables x1s and x2s so here are symbolic variables here you can see all five cases that we used i'll just illustrate the results for the first case for the case of diagonal p matrix and we are using these symbolic variables basically to define a symbolic function given by the code line 21. So here is our quadratic form. Going back to our code, the quadratic form is defined by this equation and you can in MATLAB symbolically calculate such, ex such an equation by using the symbolic toolbox and specifying the variables. So if we type the expression, here is our expression. Here it is. Okay, now that we have this expression, we basically need to uh, specify the function v for plotting basically the quadratic form. Here I will modify this version of function and I will specify the form that is equal to the symbolic form. So I'm having here x1. So I'm taking the x1 matrix, I'm taking the square of every entry inside of that matrix, I'm doing similar, similar thing to the matrix x2, basically I'm taking any, every entry of the matrix x2 and I'm taking the squares of these entries. To visualize this function, we use the MATLAB's function surf. So let's visualize the function. Here is our visualization. You can simply rotate this view. You can change the colors. You can modify basically the style of plotting. However, for brevity of this video, we will not do this right now. Okay, instead of doing that, let us illustrate something else. So let us illustrate a quadratic form that has a different shape and let's see how to plot this quadratic form. For example, let's say that we want to plot this uh, the quadratic form defined for the matrix P equal to this matrix defined on the code line 13. So let us compute our symbolic expression and let's see this symbolic expression. Okay, so here is our symbolic ex expression. Obviously, it's not being factored. So let us kind of uh, expand this expression such that we can easily define the quadratic form. Okay, so here's our quadratic form and let us modify this equation, our V function or the quadratic form such that it accurately represents this form. So what do we see over here? The first basically term of X1 is squared. So this part over here is fine. However, we have the second term. We have X1 multiplying X2. So let us type that term and we will type it like this x1 dot multiplying x2 this means that every entry of the matrix x1 multiplies every entry of x2 or actually the multiplication is performed element wise meaning that if you have a matrix and if your matrix has entries that are equal to a1, a11, a12, a21, a22, then multiplication element wise between this matrix and the matrix B with the entries B11, B12, B21, and B22. The result will have the following form a11 times b11 a12 multiplying b12 a21 multiplying b21 and a22 multiplying b22 so the multiplication is performed basically element wise this is not a standard matrix multiplication you should keep in mind these things because the mesh grid works in this way okay so we have this term that corresponds to the term over here 
that's perfect and here we have five times x2 so we have to add here five times x2 squared and let us plot this function here is the plot here is the second quadratic form defined for the matrix p similarly you can define and plot quadratic forms corresponding to any matrix p here we need to mention one important fact about quadratic forms notice that in the definition of the quadratic form given by equation one here's our equation one that defines basically the quadratic form we have assumed that the matrix p is symmetric however in many cases the matrix p is not symmetric now the question is is it possible to define a quadratic form for such matrices are there quadratic forms for non-symmetric matrices well the answer is yes well you can easily verify this fact let us assume that matrix a is non-symmetric now it is easy to show that this expression is equal to this expression over here that is if we symmetrize the matrix by taking that matrix adding its transpose and dividing by two and if we define a quadratic form for such a symmetrized matrix, this symmetrized quadratic form will be equal to our original quadratic form for non-symmetric A. And that's a nice trick if you want to define quadratic forms for non-symmetric matrices. Consequently, any non-symmetric matrix defines a quadratic form with a symmetric matrix. That is, for any non-symmetric matrix, we can always find a quadratic form with a symmetric matrix. Next, we will relate positive definite matrices with positive definite quadratic forms. So, let us first define when a matrix is positive definite. Well, the symmetric real matrix P is said to be positive definite if and only if the following condition is satisfied. So, if this condition is satisfied. We can say basically that the matrix is a positive definite matrix if and only if its quadratic form is positive definite. And this means that this quadratic form is always larger than zero except for zero. So let us go back to our original graph. And obviously, our first situation or first case given by this plot that basically comes from this matrix P1 is a positive definite matrix. It is only zero at zero and it's always positive. So these are positive definite matrices. Again, a matrix is positive definite if and only if its corresponding quadratic form is positive except for zero. Now, let us discuss a test for testing positive definiteness of a matrix. And let us first consider the two-dimensional case. So, here is our two-dimensional case in the general form of the matrix P. We can basically write this general form like this by taking P11, and then we can use the completion of squares argument basically by taking P11 out, adding the term over here and subtracting this term over here such that we can write this term over here as a square of two terms right and this is the remaining part over here and then let us analyze this expression let us assume that basically first of all p11 is positive okay then it's easy to see that the first term is positive for any x and 1 and x2 different from 0, that is, the first term, the term over here, is positive for all x1 different than 0 and x2 different than 0. Okay, so let's see what happens with the second term. 
the second term has this form over here and since p11 is always positive this is the assumption and we are assuming that x2 is not equal to 0 this whole term is positive if this expression is positive now we can multiply this expression by p11 since p11 is not equal to 0 by assumption and we obtain this expression so there are two conditions that guarantee that our two-dimensional quadratic form is positive definite. The first condition is that P11 is larger than zero, and the second condition is that this term over here is larger than zero. It shouldn't come as a surprise that this term over here and this expression over here have particular names in mathematics. They are the leading principal minors of the matrix P. The number P11 is the leading principal minor of order 1, or briefly the first order leading principal minor. And the expression, this expression over here, is the leading principal minor of order 2, or briefly the second order leading principal minor of the matrix P. The leading principal minors of certain order are determinants of the upper left sub matrices of the matrix and we will come to this definition later just for brevity over here if we have a two-dimensional matrix for example p11 p12 p12 and p22 here this is the first leading principal minor because the determinant of a number is equal to number itself and the second principal leading principal minor is the determinant of the complete matrix and the determinant of the complete matrix we can simply calculate it as p11 times p22 minus basically p12 squared so this is the determinant of the complete matrix more generally we can say that the leading principal minor of order k is the determinant of a matrix obtained by raising the last n minus k columns and n minus k rows of the matrix P. This is a very important definition. So let us illustrate this definition and let's determine minors of a 4 by 4 matrix. Here n is equal to 4. since we have four columns and four rows. And this is our matrix, for example, called A. Now, the minor of order one, or to be more precise, the leading principal minor of order one is obtained by erasing N minus K, that is equal to four minus one, last rows and columns of the matrix and this will give us the first order minor leading minor so what do we do we erase last three columns and last three rows of the matrix and what do we obtain we obtain as the first principal leading minor a11 since the determinant of a real number is equal to the number itself okay so this is our first principal leading minor or leading principal minor how to find the second one okay here again n is 4 the order is k is equal to 2 so we need to erase 4 minus 2 is equal to 2 last rows and last columns of the matrix so in this case I will change the color in order to better, better illustrate what are we erasing we will erase last two columns and last two rows and our sub matrix 
that I will denote by basically D2 will be A11, A12, A21, A22. So the second order leading principal minor is equal to the determinant of that matrix. And you can evaluate this determinant. Okay, so let's see what happens when the order is equal to 3. Let us go back to the definition. N is 4. K is now 3. And we need to erase 4 minus 3 last rows and columns. Again, I will change the color to make everything more visible. So we are erasing one last column and one last row. And the submatrix that I will denote by D3 is A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33. And the leading principle minor of order 3 is simply equal to this determinant. And similarly, when k is equal to 0, you obtain basically the determinant of the complete matrix. Now that we know what are the leading principal minors, we can state the condition for testing positive definiteness of a matrix in the general case, that is, for any n times n matrix. So let us consider the matrix P, that is n times n, here are the entries, and the condition for testing the positive definiteness is the following. This matrix P is positive definite if and only if the following conditions are met. The first order leading principal minor is positive. That is, the determinant of the upper left one by one corner of P is positive. So, determinant of this term should be positive. This is the first condition. Okay, let us state the second condition. The second order leading principal minor should be positive. That is, the determinant of the upper left 2 by 2 corner of P is positive. So, the determinant of this submatrix should be positive. Okay, let us state the third condition. The third condition is similar to the second condition and it states that the third order leading principal minor should be positive. That is, the determinant of the upper level 3 by 3 corner of P is positive. So, if we basically take this sublock and if we compute its determinant, this determinant should be positive in order to ensure that the matrix is positive definite. And following this, these conditions, the last condition is that the determinant of the matrix P is positive. That is, the leading principal minor of, minor of order 0 should be positive. And if these conditions are met, then our matrix P is positive definite. So let us apply this test on the following matrix. So we have this matrix P and we ask our, ourselves the following question. Is this matrix positive definite? Okay, so all the leading principal minor should be positive. So the first principal minor, the second principal minor, the third principal minor, we compute determinants. These determinants are positive. Consequently, our matrix is positive definite. And to visualize these matrices, we have plotted these two graphs. So this is basically a positive definite matrix corresponding to P1. And again, this is a positive definite uh, quadratic form. I said positive definite matrices, but actually I meant positive definite quadratic form that actually corresponds to positive definite matrix. And it's given over here. And this form corresponds to the matrix P2. Beside positive definite matrices, we also have negative definite matrices. We, we are saying that the matrix is basically negative definite if and only if this condition holds true. That is, the matrix, or actually the quadratic form, is negative except for when x is equal to 0. 
Then we have negative semi-definite matrices and we have positive semi-definite matrices. So the matrix is negative semi-definite if and only if this condition holds true. That is, this quadratic form is negative semi-definite. Notice the difference between these two conditions. Here we allow that for some x's, large that are not equal to zero this quadratic form is equal to zero and that's the main distinction between positive def actually negative definite and negative semi-definite again here in this case there might be some or there should be some better to say some x that is different from zero when i say different for, from zero i mean that the entries of x are different from zeros and for this x different from zeros different from zero this quadratic form is equal to zero similarly we define positive semi-definite matrix as a matrix for which this quadratic form is positive semi-definite that is there is some x different from zero for it, for which this form is equal to zero and indefinite matrix, a matrix P is indefinite if and only if there is some X for which the quadratic form, form is positive and there are some other X for which this quadratic form is negative. Okay, so let us visualize negative definite matrices. Basically, a quadratic form defined for the matrix P3 is negative definite and this quadratic form looks like this. How about matrix P4? Is this matrix positive definite, negative definite, positive semi-definite, negative semi-definite, or indefinite? Well, if we visualize this quadratic form, we will obtain something that looks like this, that resembles a settled point. So obviously over here, you can, by graphical inspection, you can determine that there are some x's, for example, some x1 and x2 over here, for which this quadratic form is negative, and there is some other set of x1 and x2 for which this quadratic form is positive. Hence, or consequently, the matrix P4 is not even positive definite, not negative definite, not positive semi-definite, not negative semi-definite, but this matrix, the matrix P4, is basically indefinite. Okay, so let us now illustrate what are the semi-definite matrices. Basically, our P5 matrix that's uh, basically given over here, this is our P5 matrix, generates a quadratic form that's positive semi-definite. Consequently, this matrix P5 is positive semi-definite matrix. And how to mathematically show that? Well, if we write V of X, uh, we will basically obtain this expression, and then we can simply write it as X1 plus X2 squared. Now, this X1 and X2 squared are obviously zero when x1 is zero and x2 zero however if x1 is equal to minus x2 this quadratic form becomes zero otherwise it's always positive consequently this quadratic form is positive semi-definite and it can be visualized by this graph. So this is a positive semi-definite quadratic form that corresponds to positive definite matrix. And obviously, here's the line. X1 is equal to minus X2 for which this whole function is zero. Similarly to the condition for positive definiteness, 
there is also a condition for negative definiteness, and it's stated over here. A matrix P is negative definite if and only if these conditions are satisfied. That is, the matrix P is negative definite if and only if its leading principal minors alternate the sign starting from the first order leading principal minor that should be negative. So the first order should be negative, the second order positive, the third order negative, etc. Or in other words, the matrix P is negative definite if and only if its leading principal minors of all the degree are negative and principal minors, or better to say leading principal minors of even degree are positive. Okay, now we also have a condition for indefiniteness. A matrix P is indefinite if and only if some leading principal minor are non-zero, but their sign does not follow the pattern for either positive definite or negative definite matrix. So for example, if you obtain that the first order leading principal minor is positive. However, the second order leading principal minor is negative. Obviously, this pattern does not correspond to positive definite or negative definite matrices. Consequently, you can conclude that such a matrix matrix is indefinite. So far, we have stated the conditions for strict positive definiteness, for strict negative definiteness, and for indefiniteness. However, you might ask me the following question. Are there conditions for positive and negative semi-definiteness? Okay. The conditions for positive and negative semi-definiteness definitely exist. However, they are different from the conditions for strict positive and negative definiteness since they involve all principal minors. So these conditions involve all principal minors and not only the leading principal minors. So there is distinction between principal minors and leading principal minors. So principal minors are simply obtained by raising, again, certain columns and rows. However, the column and row numbers should be the same. So if I raise the first uh, column, then I need to raise the first row. If I raise the second row, I need to raise the first column. For example, uh, to better illustrate the principal minor, let us consider this matrix P. Okay, so what are its principal minors? Well, we can say that if we want to erase the first column, or actually the first row, we need to erase the first column, and the remaining part is the principal minor, and it's given over here. Similarly, if we erase the second column, we need to erase the second row, and the remaining part is given over here, and it's seen over here. Again, if we erase the third column, we need to erase the third row, and the remaining submatrix is given over here. So the condition for positive semi-definiteness is that a matrix P is positive semi-definite if and only if its all principal minors are larger than zero or equal zero. Similarly, we have a conditions for negative semi-definiteness. We can say a matrix P is negative semi-definite if and only if its principal minors of all degree are smaller than or equal zero and principal minors or even degrees are larger than or equal to zero. Okay, that would be all for today. I hope that you like this video. If you like these video tutorials I create, please subscribe and support my channel by pressing the like button. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.